Welcome to Straight Talk for Entrepreneurs, where we reveal what it really takes to build a successful business. Whether you are starting with an idea or growing your business, this is the show for you. My guests and I will show you how to build a strong mindset, a powerful body, a profitable business. Hi, I'm Brandon C. White, and this is Build a Business Success Secrets. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Build a Business. I am so grateful to have Amelia Lynn here from Saga. And Amelia and I met, we were just talking about it before we jumped on here. I actually, I actually said, Amelia, we, it's been like three months ago. And she, she said, no, I, I don't think it was three months ago, Brandon. I, I think it was in September, right, Amelia? Yes. Um, and it was, we met in a mastermind group. I've talked about masterminds before. There's, they're super cool. You meet super interesting people. Uh, somehow I remember getting linked up uh, with this group because of going through the, the YC whatever uh, program and I linked up and then Amelia and I hit it off and actually I think it was the first meeting Amelia you said or, or you, we, you go around the room and everybody tells what they're doing and Amelia says well I'm going out to raise money next week and this was a Friday and she had her whole her whole week booked and I was like hey uh, I'm happy to help you. Like, you want me to take a look at your deck or you, you said something when you heard my background, like, Hey, will you look at it? And I was like, Hey, you cannot go into this. And, and we got Amelia fixed up and, and then Amelia goes out and hits it out of the park and comes home with over a million bucks. But thank you so much for coming on a Friday. We'll go into that story, but thank you so much for joining on a Friday afternoon um, and drinking that extra caffeine to keep us going. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Yeah. No, I mean, thank you so much for like, Everything along the way, uh, you've been a huge part of this journey. Yeah, it's been awesome to watch and, and you've been successful. So for all the listeners, I, I want to go back a little bit before we get to Saga because I think your story is really interesting in that you actually worked in corporate America, for lack of a better way to put it, here in, here in Silicon Valley. And you really came across the country to come to the Valley. So how, how did you, can you take us back to that? I know you went to business school and you did some stuff before then. Like, how do you wind up living in Mountain View, California, being the CEO and co-founder of a, of a startup? Making- yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I grew up in Texas and that's where my family is. Um, I, I actually, yeah, I didn't start in tech. I actually studied physics in undergrad. Um, so I worked in uh, lab research. I worked on nanotechnology. So I spent my days in labs working on very, very tiny things, very cool things, um, but things that probably would take decades to turn into reality that someone could could use. Uh, and, and you know, for me, it's always been about building. I love building things. I've always loved making things. And so I was incredibly inspired by the cool technology that I got to work on, but I really wanted to figure out that second half of the equation. You know, I wanted the things that I worked on to get beyond the four walls of the lab and into real people's hands. And that was the first time that I really got interested. This was like an undergrad. Um, I really got interested in startups. I thought, this is fascinating. These people take ideas and they figure out how to make them real and they get them into the hands of everyday people and, and help, that, help, that, uh, help that idea thrive. That really fascinated me. So when I was an undergrad, I decided I was gonna take a summer and uh, not work in labs, which is what I'd been doing pretty much all the time, and I was gonna go work in a startup. Um, and I totally fell in love with it, you know? I, I loved that. We could come up with an idea in the morning and, and maybe it was live by the afternoon. I mean, that is so, so different from the lab, science lab research world. It, you can be waiting for a decade for results. Um, and that, that was kind of how it started. I, I just, uh, I, so after I graduated, I moved, I actually moved straight out here. I moved straight out here after undergrad to Mountain View. And my first job was at a tiny startup out here. Um, it was about 17 people. And uh, yeah, that, you know, I, I, I knew that, I knew that there must be something about what made these things succeed it had to do with this quote unquote businessy stuff. And I didn't know anything about businessy stuff. I mean, I, you know, I was a physics major, but I so figured how, so what yeah. type of startup was that? It was a, 
uh, it was a marketing startup. So we helped, we helped like everyday small business owners, like mom and pop shops, basically get into online marketing. We would automate the online marketing for them so that they didn't have to get all confused about, oh my gosh, I'm looking at the Google AdWords interface and it's just absolutely horrible. So we, that's what we did. So how do you, so, I mean, and you know this now, you know, a lot of people feel that they're in this type of career and, and there couldn't be any different career, right? I mean, you're in physics in a lab in Texas or wherever you are and, and you decide to move to Silicon Valley. So how do you convince them to get a marketing job, Amelia? Just Oh man, yeah, yeah, that was definitely kind of a little bit of an adventure. Yeah, so I was on the East Coast, so I did my undergrad at Harvard, and so that's where I was. And um, yeah, it definitely was a little bit of an adventure, you know, trying to convince someone. I, I was like, hey, will you, <laughs> I thought the best way to learn about this like marketing stuff, I don't know what marketing is, I think they write taglines. I thought, well, the best way to learn about that would probably be to get a job in it. You know, I'm just, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna learn to swim. I don't dive in the deep end. And uh, yeah, I mean, you could definitely imagine, you know, I was reaching out and saying, hey, will you, will you hire me for a marketing job? And you're like, you're a physics major. Like, what? So how what did you, you so how did you break what did through? I do? How did I, how did I get yeah. this? Well, so my pitch was, I said, look, I don't know that much about marketing, but I'm good with numbers and I'm good with data. Is there any part of your marketing where, you could use someone who was good at that because I, I spent a lot of time looking at data and spreadsheets. I don't know how to make that work. And so that kind of ended up being the little bit of the opening was um, this would happen in undergrad. I got an internship. So this is before my first full-time job at a startup where they said, you know what, we've got all this customer data on purchases and we kind of suspect that there might be something good in that. Nobody's ever had the time to look at it. You think you could do something with that? And I said, yeah, sure. Why don't you throw me in that? And so my internship was just like trawling through these enormous Excel spreadsheets. I didn't even know how to use Excel all that well. So I had this manual next to me. And every time I tried to figure out something, I would read about it in the manual and then try to figure out how to do it in the spreadsheet. But I ended up being able to, to tell them that there's actually a very small fraction of their user base that was outsized responsible for most of the purchases. It was disproportionately where their revenue was coming from, but they were catering to the other 90%. And I said, you know, really, you're really undercapitalizing on building features into your, your game. And here's what I think you should build for them. If you look at their purchase history, you know, this is what um, this is what they're really buying. It's this thing where you have a, you have a couple items, but I'm pretty sure if you made 10 more of these, like you'd be, you'd be making money from these, from these guys. Um, and so that was kind of, that was kind of my angle when I moved to Silicon Valley was, uh, I can be an especially data driven marketer for you. You know, if you like that. Um, and so this, this happened to be a startup where almost every single employee was an engineer. It was like a team of all engineers. They were like super nerdy. And I think they really loved the idea. They were like, we're going to hire a super nerd for our, for our marketing you know, we're going to get a physics major to do our marketing. Uh, and that, that was how I, that was how I got my first marketing job. That's awesome. So how, how long were you there? So I was there for about a year and a half and uh, they ended up getting acquired by Yahoo. Um, so that was about like beginning of 2013. Uh, so it was still pretty small uh, at the time, you know, it was probably about maybe 30 people by the time that I left. So I, I didn't go to Yahoo. Um, Why, what, what, what made that decision for you? I had, I had wanted to go to Optimizely. So Optimizely was, um, the Optimizely was a lot smaller at that time. So I, I, people kind of know it now is, oh yeah, like it's that website AB testing tool. But at the time, most people had no idea what it was, but I had been using their tool. I actually had been trying to convince our company to use their tool because I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was a really cool product. And I loved what they were doing because I thought what Optimizely, I thought what was really cool about Optimizely was they were empowering everyday people and business owners with data, you know, and, and I'm such an, I'm such a nerd about that stuff. Like, I mean, it was basically like, you know, they're doing the thing that I love, but trying to make it really accessible for people, you know, these giant behemoth companies like Amazon and Google and Netflix, of course they can have whole AB testing teams and build custom tools, but what if you've got a blog, right? Um, so I loved that. I thought that was very, very cool. And so I actually, um, yeah, I pitched them <laughs> on hiring me. Um, they did not have a position for me, so that's another story as to how I could how I convinced how I convinced them to hire me. <laughs> and what what and what was the magic of that? Oh yeah, so uh, 
So I, I definitely kind of pitched them on this. Look, I think <laughs> it's gonna, you're gonna laugh so much. Like, you know, I feel like, I feel like I just like convinced people to try to create positions for me. But uh, <laughs> I was like, I think that you need a quantitative marketer. You know, you're, <laughs> so I, I told them, I said, you know, I think I could really add a lot of value to you. Like, this is my skill set. And if that's interesting to you, you know, I, I think, uh, I, I think that I, I could add value. And I basically, I, I networked into the company. So I found people I knew um, who had connections into the company and a really good friend of mine into kind of vouching for me. And so that's how I got the, um, that's how I got the, uh, the interview. Um, and uh, yeah. And you, I, landed, and you landed that job. Did you, did. did you use LinkedIn or anything or did you just go through your network? Was there... Uh, well, you know, a lot of people tell me, yeah, I mean, a lot of people tell me, Amelia, like, hey, Brandon, you know, all these people, we can't replicate that. And the truth is, is that I, I, I still replicate the, the, the persistence, right? Like, I'll find somebody that knows someone, I'll figure that out, whether I got to use Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, call three friends, like, isn't that how it works? I mean, that, that is totally what I ended up doing. And, and it's, it's actually what I recommend to people now too. I mean, it was like, <laughs> you know, I tell people, I'm like, you know, if, if you can, if you're not trying to hide it from your, you know, an employer or whatever, if you're on the job hunt, like post that on Facebook. Like, I mean, I was at every, every, every get together I was at, right. Someone's birthday party, whatever, whatever social event I had. <laughs> Do you know people here? Do you know people here? Do you know people here? you never know where that's going to come from. So I'm a huge believer um, in networking. I have actually, I have a cool tip. Gosh, I think it's probably outdated now, but there used to be this great feature on Facebook where in the search bar, you could search uh, friends who work at Pinterest. You could also search friends of friends who work at Pinterest. It was basically like that link, the LinkedIn search, you know, for first order connections, second order connections, except what I found was that because Facebook actually had people who I, I really was close to, uh, the hit rate on me asking for intros there was, you know, like four times as high. Wow. So I ended up doing a ton of networking searching, um, through, through Facebook, but yeah. Oh, when we get to the part where I tell you about how I got the job at Udacity, then I'll really have to tell you about the networking, the networking game and how I got that job. So <laughs> let, let's just, let's just sum this up. You, you, you do your undergraduate in physics. You're a, working in a lab. Something inside you decides that that ain't going to work because the timeline's too long. You, over the summer of undergraduate school, you do an internship and you sell yourself as a physics person who's good with data and then you convince, after you get out of the lab, a company in Silicon Valley, that you're a physics nerd that's good with data and can do marketing, which you have little to no experience at. And, and then they get acquired and you decide that you don't want to go to Yahoo, that you basically want to work at this other company and convince them to create a position. Yeah, that's, 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 that's pretty, that's pretty close. <laughs> so now you're at Optima, Misley, and, and what happens? So, uh, so I was at Optimizely, um, uh, and yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a fantastic time. I mean, so I was there when I, when I joined, it was a lot smaller. It was about 45, 50 people. And, um, it grew to 250 while I was there. So quintupled in size which was such a bizarre experience for me because I, I mean, I was still relatively young, you know, I hadn't been out of school that long, but, uh, you know, by the end I'd been there eight longer than 80% of people. And so people kind of looked at me and thought, you know, Oh, you're, you're the veteran you're an you know, old person. Yeah. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're an old timer. Like, you know, all these things, but you know, obviously it was, it's really just the company was growing so fast. It was incredible, incredible, um, experience to get to be part of, uh, you know, kind of that, that hyper growth period of a company. Um, definitely just some of the most, uh, just some of the smartest and, and just the most amazing um, humans that I got to work with. Um, and uh, I guess I should also say, so one part that you probably shouldn't give me credit for in the, in the previous, in the previous uh, uh, kind of part of the story is I didn't know we were going to get acquired by Yahoo. Oh, no, I, yeah, I would figure that. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I, so we, don't, I, we don't, we, we hope for all that here, right? I, 
had, I had moved to Optimizely about, I want to say maybe three months for the acquisition. So it wasn't like I had a choice or something when I was going to Yahoo, although, oh, God, yeah. although, although frankly, I, I, it probably wasn't for me. You know, I, I really, really love working, I think, at, at kind of that, I, just that small company. But so I was at Optimizely. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so I, had, I was in a bit of an unusual situation. So when I was an undergrad and I had been thinking about, hey, I want to learn how to do this startup thing. This is really cool. Um, I don't know anything about business stuff, but I, I gather that some that's important. I don't know what that is, but that seems important. Um, I actually applied to business school during that time. So I had applied for a deferred admission to Harvard Business School. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get it. And so I was in this very unusual position where I basically had this guaranteed admission for two years out. Wow. And they were, yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was just a great fit for what I wanted to do because I was pretty sure if I went straight to business school, I wasn't going to understand anything. I just didn't right. have any context. And so I thought it would be good for me to go and get some work experience. Then I can come back to business school and that I'll get a lot more value out of it. And then, so it was, it was perfect because um, I basically had two years to go do whatever crazy thing I wanted to do. And that could be going working at a startup. And I was like, what's the worst is going to happen? Well, you're gonna go. You're gonna go to school at some point, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so it's great. Uh, but while I was at Optimizely, the deadline came up, and I was learning so much at Optimizely, I really didn't want to go. And so I asked them if I could defer for another year. So I oh, wow. so I de so I deferred for one more year. I had them push it to three years, but the three year deadline was coming around, and they were saying, you know, you really got to tell us are you coming are you coming or not. Uh, so. Apparently, apparently they don't really do deferments for for a fourth year. <laughs> so I so I had to make this decision of, am I gonna go, and make this very quite a pretty big change? Am I gonna leave this um, this place that I, I'm really having a, a great time and I'm learning so much and I, I love the people that I work with and the product that we work on, uh, and go to business school or am I gonna stay? And I really agonized about that. Um, I mean, really agonized about the decision. Uh, and was very on the fence about it, um, but ultimately decided that I was going to go, which actually felt like a very risky decision at that time. It's funny because I think a lot of people think of business school as the safe decision, and they're like, oh, you know, what a cop out. Like, you went to business school, you could have done this. But for me, I was like, I'm leaving something that's really kind of fantastic. You know, people, I, I just remember so many people said, you know, why would you do this? You're on a rocket ship. You don't get off the rocket ship. Why'd you go to business school? Yeah. And so why did you? Yeah. Um, in the end, it was a lot more for personal reasons. It was more for personal fulfillment than anything else. So, so here's the thing. I am definitely someone who, um, I love being exposed to lots of different perspectives and ideas. I really love that. And that's how I learn. And that's, you know, that's what really, uh, excites me. I had spent the entirety of my very short career up until that point in a very specific, very niche world, which is, you know, Bay Area, like Silicon Valley internet technology startups. And that's all I, that's all I knew. And the thing was, and this is sort of a blessing, but also sort of a curse, I was liking it so much, I really could see myself doing nothing, like I could see myself spending the rest of my life doing that. And I thought, wow, I could really be happy just, just doing this. But... I did feel like, you know, is that really good for me? Am I really, I'm sure I'm losing out on a lot of other perspectives. Um, and so this idea of, you know, what if you just take two years, not forever, two years, two years, and you can always come back, but two years where you go and immerse yourself in an environment where there's going to be a lot of other people, you know, smart people, and they're all thinking about the same questions and problems that you are, but they're going to come at it from completely different backgrounds and completely different perspectives. They're probably going to really challenge some of the things that, that I believe and why I believe them. And then, you know what, you can always come back to Silicon Valley, but I did feel like I was going to feel more personally fulfilled having done that. Um, so yeah, I think that I probably went to business school for very different reasons from a lot of other people. You know, I, I, I wasn't convinced that career-wise it was going to make or break things for me. Um, as you probably know, I would say having an MBA in Silicon Valley 
it's questionable whether that really adds to your sellability in some circles it's maybe even negative right you know, so, I, so i wasn't going there for that <laughs> Um, and you know, if I wanted to get the startup experience, I should have just stayed where I was. Um, so I, I really did have to kind of come to terms with the idea that I, if I was going to make this decision, it had to be because it had to be because I want to do it personally. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that makes sense. I mean, um, you and I've talked a little bit about it and, and I went to business school for a lot of different reasons. Um, one is because at the career that I was in at the time, which is venture capital, actually you you sort of need the checkbox because everybody has right. an MBA and you need a top MBA. Right. I mean, doesn't mean that MBAs are good or bad or ranking, but in that world, having you know a top MBA is is key. So that that was the reason I would I I, I did it. That makes sense. But, you know, one of the things, you know, you made a really mature decision, and, and one of the things that I'd love to hear your thought on is a lot of people who I help and are entrepreneurs, somehow business school has taught or marketed to them that that's really where you're going to go and learn everything about business and you're going to come out of there and, and be able to start your own company and, you know, it's all going to be fine. Now, you know, well, we, we don't have to name our names or, or when we went to business school. They're all good business school, right? They're, they, business school is a good thing. Like it's a good insurance policy at some level. But, you know, my experience coming out of there was, and I am a better person for it. Make no mistake, right? Like it, it teaches you some very fundamental school uh, skills. You get to have a, uh, like you were looking for many different perspectives of many different people that, you know, can be fulfilling. But as it relates to having to have an MBA to run a business, I'm not really sure that that's the case. And to your point here in Silicon Valley, you know, depending on where you're going, it, it could be a liability, right? Because they, they believe that you, you're actually starting to get too trained in a way that doesn't open your horizon. What, what, like, what's your takeaway after that experience? Yeah, so that's interesting. So I went into business school for two big reasons. One was that I really wanted to be exposed to a wide variety of perspectives and backgrounds. I know I've already talked about that. The second big thing on my wish list that I wanted out of business school was I wanted a fundamental grounding in some of these things that, you know, I was trying to figure out like marketing and sales and support at this little tiny startup. And like, I think my strategies were maybe one step above throwing spaghetti against the wall to see what would stick, right? And so my motivation was, gosh, maybe I could be a much better contributor and much faster if I had some basic grounding in some of these areas. So those were the two that I really wanted to kind of, I thought I'm going to learn some great tactics and I'm going to learn some really great best practices and principles and that's what I'm going to take away. Um, I think that on item number one, business school checked the box. I do feel like I met some really incredible people from backgrounds where if I had stayed in Silicon Valley startup world my whole life, I just don't think we would have crossed paths or maybe we would have crossed paths and I just wouldn't have known, you know, um, really digging that. And, and I definitely met some just incredible, incredible natural leaders who I think have become very dear friends and who I, I really look to um, you know, and admire, uh, for, for advice on, on, on anything that requires sort of, you know, like people or, or leadership or anything like that. Um, so I think number one, checked the box. I'm very grateful for that. And I think business school did open my horizons there. A uh, number two, I think for my specific interests, which was startups, I'm not sure that HBS was a great fit, you know, and it's tough to say that because it's an incredible business school. But, you know, at the time that I went, and I know it's shifting now, but HBS is famous for um, basically essentially doing the Socratic method. It's very discussion-based, right? And that's great uh, for discussing ideas. But the thing that just drove me nuts was I was like, you can't go into a startup and say, oh, <laughs> let's, let's discuss some great, I got some great ideas. Let's, let's talk about them. You got to actually know how to do the thing. 
And I really, really missed that. I missed having more hands-on um, practice and, and really kind of trying to do real world things and not just like talking about marketing principles, but okay, literally go set up a Google, do you know how to set up a Google AdWords campaign? Can you do it today? How do you do that? Um, and so really what I ended up spending my time on at HBS was I signed up for everything I could find that was more practical and hands-on. And there, you know, that, that wasn't the majority of classes there, but I tried to seek that out. I signed up to do independent projects where, you know, I'd build something on my own. I'd come up with side projects. Um, <laughs> you know, I ended up cross-registering for classes at other schools that I thought would be very helpful. So I actually ended up taking a machine learning course at the engineering school, um, like actually getting, you know, like writing code. Um, was like teaching myself Python uh, on, on, on weekends and, and evenings. Um, so I, I mean, I, I guess you could say sort of create a little bit of a shadow curriculum uh, for myself of, of things that I thought were maybe going to be a little bit more practical um, and hands-on. Now I will say, I will say there is one, there is some very serious value that has come out of HBS that I did not recognize until years afterwards, which was fundraising. So I absolutely think that in fundraising, uh, the connection to the HBS network definitely, definitely uh, gave me avenues and, and opened doors that uh, might not have been available to me otherwise. So <laughs> yeah, I think that, that alone. <laughs> I, I think that's true. Um, you know, I will, I will say that for me, you know, if you, if, if someone asks like, Brandon, how did you get good at, so good at building financials and models and you know I cut my teeth on that at America Online and marketing analysis like being thrown to the wolves and figuring out really complex things around churn curves and cohort analysis and all that sort of stuff and how it flows through financial models and then ultimately venture capital um, I think business school gave me the foundation but you know for all our listeners and I'm really grateful in you sharing it the takeaway is, is you really, you don't need to go to business school to build a business. And there's a ton of cases out there. A lot no, of my mentors, so. quite frankly, barely graduated from uh, college and, you know, are worth a billion dollars. And I have people that are like that who did go to school too, but um, you know, you, you don't have to go to business school necessarily to learn the principles. And in many ways, you know, and there's many people who are really rich uh, around the world, but in Silicon Valley too, who, you know, went to okay college and figured out business because business at the end of the day is solving a problem for someone and exchanging money for that because you're truly solving their problem. And I, I tell you that a really successful mentor of mine, Warren Buffett actually he took his company public and then Warren Buffett bought it. And uh, he sat on the board with Warren and I used to fish with him every Friday and he, he'd say, Brandon, business is really simple. There's a top line that you get because you solve a problem, person's problems. There's a bunch of expenses and there's this bottom line. That's the money you get to keep. And, you know, there's a lot of things in between there, but at the end of the day, you know, there's sales and marketing and things like that. But at the crux of it, you're, you're solving a problem. So um, I appreciate you sharing that. So you go to business school and now what? Yeah. So when I was in business school, so actually, yeah, you'll probably find this interesting. Um, when I was going to business school, I, I mean, I, 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 I had been having a great time, you know, working in the startup world, definitely enjoying it a ton. But I wanted to be open minded because, again, I sort of recognize I haven't seen very much of the world, and I kind of thought, well, let me be open minded. Like when I go to business school, I'm going to meet people from all these different backgrounds, different industries, and maybe one of them will catch my eye. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you know, that'll be the thing. One of the things that I was interested in, I mean, I, I did, I, I was very interested in the startup world, um, but there are different parts of the startup world. And so VC was actually one of the things that I, I looked at. So I spent about a semester, uh, the first semester, talking to a bunch of classmates who had all worked in VC. And that was one of the things that I wanted to figure out. I was like, is this going to be something that's interesting to me? Like, that seems really cool. Wow, I could spend my whole day talking to all kinds of startups and like hearing about the cool things they're working on. But I have to tell you, after semester, I decided VC was not going to be for me. Um, I think I knew after a semester that that's that I I really wanted to be in an operational role in startups, and that was still what was fulfilling for me. And so, um, 
anyway, so we can, we can, <laughs> we can actually talk about, you know, there's, there's more there if you, if you, if you, you probably know all about this, but, um, but yeah, so I actually had a, had an offer to join a venture capital firm when I was graduating. It, it wasn't something I was seeking out. I have to be honest. It was something that kind of, honestly, it just, it's really fortunate. It just came my way. Um, and I said, I said, no, you know, I said, I just don't think this is for me right now. I think I really, I think I really want to be in a startup. I want to build something. In the end, I felt like if I went into venture capital, I was going to spend my whole day jealous of the people who I talked to. And I would feel cool that I was getting to enable their journeys, but literally I'd look across the table and be like, man, I wish I were in your seat. Like that, that, that's so much more fun. I wish I were, <laughs> I wish I yeah, were there. I, I know, I know exactly what you're saying. Cause I had the chance to be on both sides of the table and you know, I think I voted with my feet and, and, <laughs> and, and the, the, the universe sometimes works in mysterious ways. And you know, the key up, the key to life in many ways, as you've explained here, is know, knowing yourself. Like, you know, you've done a lot of work on yourself here. And, you know, I say everybody thinks it's the business part too, but you got to know who you are. You got to be comfortable with that and know where you're good and, and where you're not. Um, but I think it's pretty exciting on this side of the table. Um, <laughs> the, 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 I like it. The, I, I mean, uh, you know, you get to create things every single, every single day and more so solve people's problems to in, in any of our products, which we're going to get to with you, which is, you know, make them have a better life, whatever that means, yeah. right? That, that, right. That, 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 whatever that means. So you turn down this venture capital opportunity yeah. and what, where do you, what do you do? So, um, I had actually been spending some time talking to prior mentors of mine, previous managers, just people I think of as mentors, and asking them, you know, is there anything that you feel like I should be considering? I, you know, I don't, I don't have that much perspective, honestly, on like, you know, the roles out there. I ended up working in marketing, but is there anything you think I should be looking at? And the first time someone said product, I completely dismissed it. Someone said, well, you should think about product. And I thought, I don't know anything about products. I don't even know what those people do. I thought, no way. I think like maybe the fourth time that someone suggested product, I thought, well, maybe, okay, maybe I should, maybe I should think about product. And so, um, yeah, so I decided during business school that I was going to move into product. I um, ended up doing an internship in product kind of as a little bit of a test run really to see if I thought I, I liked it and if I was good at it um, and ended up coming out the other end of it uh, thinking, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I do like this. And I think, I think, I think I am good at this. And this is kind of almost the core of everything that I love, right? I love being, I love thinking about stuff to build. And I love working with a lot, like different people in different roles to make that happen. And I'm very much, I'm kind of a generalist, you know, I'm kind of that person where you can just throw me at some random thing and I'll go figure it out. And I, I felt like in so many jobs in the past, that was a liability for me that I was more of a generalist than a specialist. I think working as a, in product was the first time that I felt like it actually was a strength. And that was really cool. So I decided I was gonna be, I was gonna, I was gonna go find a job in product. And so now I was in the position of, all right, cool. I'm gonna go pitch some, <laughs> I'm gonna go pitch some Silicon Valley startups on why they should hire me as a product manager when I've never actually been a full-time product manager. It was like this whole, this whole game over again. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I had a, I had a whole checklist. I made a checklist of all the things I wanted in my next job and my stretch goals. And I like literally, I just scoured, scoured the universe. I had, I had all these stretch goals and one of them was like, it'd be so cool if I could work in online code education. Cause I think it's a fascinating space. It's one that I personally have, um, gotten value from. Like I taught myself a bunch of stuff and I think it's, it's just super interesting. Um, and so literally like Udacity was like the only company that matched all of the criteria that I wanted. So can you give me an idea just for the listeners? Like, oh, yeah. um, tell me two or three of the criteria that you had for your job. Was it, I get to work my own hours? Was it, you know? Oh what? yeah. What was it? So, so there were some basic ones. Like I want to work in product. I want it to be in the Bay area. Um, I want it to be at a tech company. 
And then there were all these kind of like wanna haves. I was like, well, I would like to be on a product team that's between like two and 10 people because I want some mentorship, but I don't want it to be huge. And it would be amazing if, you know, it was a product centric company, one where a product is actually a center of influence. So I think I'm going to learn a lot there. And it would be super cool if, you know, it were also in like online code education, because that's just like a, a very interesting area. <laughs> I mean, I, I just scoured. <laughs> but, you just thought, made, but you just made this up. You're just like, you just used, it'd be super cool if, and you just kept <laughs> rattling that off. Right, right. So I had, a, I had the, the checklist was like two parts. It was like, here's all the things that are core. Like, I definitely want this in the next job. And then here's all the stretch goals. And I was like, okay, cool. I can go find a bunch of companies that match all the core things, but I wonder how many actually match these stretch goals. And there was literally, I mean, I literally found one. It was Udacity. Well, I think that's um, awesome. And being specific, I think what, I, what I'm hearing is you are very specific. So the things that didn't fit your criteria in any of those, it was very easy for you to filter out. Yes, that's true. Yeah. So I think that, I think that's kind of how I've always gone about job searches for me, because for me, so much of my fulfillment at, from work is from the specific company and product that I'm working on. If I'm not working on something that, you know, if we're not making something that I'm excited about, it's really hard, I think, for me to, to be motivated. And so a lot of my job search has always been around, you know, what kind of company, what kind of product do I want to work on? And so I do do a lot of kind of first filtering that way. And I almost, I would say that's almost my first stage of filtering more than the role. Um, versus, so instead of going out and saying, hey, where are all the places that are hiring for marketers? Let me go talk to those places. I really went the other way. I said, I'm going to make a list of 10 companies where if they said they would hire me tomorrow, I'd be so excited to go work for them. And Optimize is one of those companies. And I went about it as like, how am I going to convince them to hire me? Like, yeah. irrespective of what jobs are on their site, how do I convince them to hire me? <laughs> well, I think that's probably it. how you turned into an entrepreneur, which we're going to get to soon. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, you got to figure out as an entrepreneur, uh, there's no rules. There's no advertisements for your product or your solution. So, um, so you wind up convincing them how, I don't know what the magic was, but that you're going to be a project man, a product manager. Yes. I've never done that before. That's correct. That's correct. Oh man. So, so they actually turned me down. They turned me down the first time outright. So it was, uh, it's quite, it's quite the process. So it was very scary for me, honestly, that only one company fit my stretch criteria because I, I kind of had to make this decision. I was like, okay, I have about one semester left in business school. What am I going to spend that semester on in terms of the job search? I could go and, you know, pitch 50 companies so why they should hire me, but I really want to work at this one. So I could spend all my time really figuring out how to convince them to hire me, but it's risky because if they say no in the end, I'll have burned a bunch of time that I could have used, um, you know, to, to, to line up other opportunities. So I, I did kind of have to make that decision and I decided I was going to go for it. I decided I was, I was doing the risky thing and putting all my eggs in one basket. Not that Udacity knew that at the time, but so I reached out to them in January and I said, I want to work as, I want to apply to be a product manager. And the recruiter at the time, a uh, super nice guy, he just flat out said, you know what? We've already hired. We just, we just did a bunch of hiring for product managers. We just hired like six of them. There isn't going to be any more hiring for product managers for at least the next six months. I can guarantee you it's not happening. So sorry. So then I decided that the way I was going to get this job was I was going to get referred into Udacity, but I was going to get referred in so many times that they would not be able to ignore me. That was my plan. I was like, I'm going to get referred in so many freaking times that they'll just have to talk to, talk to me out of curiosity if nothing else, because like I, I, would, I would be curious. If somebody kept coming across my desk like over and over again, I, I, I'd at least want to be like, why? Why is this person coming in? So I spent the next four, five months networking the crap out of Udacity and just finding person after person after person who knew someone who knew someone who has some connection to Udacity and would talk to me. 
And I ended up getting my resume referred in, I think by the end, it was like eight times. Wow. Um, <laughs> you know, and they weren't even hiring for product managers, but I just get people to put my resume and be like, if you're looking for a product manager, you should talk to this person. Um, and by the end, um, it's actually kind of funny because, so I got my offer literally the night before graduation. So like the next day was the graduation ceremony and I got that call and it was from the same recruiter who had said no in January. He remembered me and he said, yeah, you know, it's so funny, <laughs> but like everyone just seemed to know you <laughs> like what a crazy small world. And I was just like, yeah, I know. Right. Like what a crazy small world. Like that's so, that's so wild. I was like, I'm just never telling you. I'm just like, I'm never, no. <laughs> I just never know <laughs> how that's hard I awesome. worked to make that happen. Um, but yeah. And, and I think like all the people who had referred me in, uh, most of them didn't realize you know, like, you know, that there were so many. <laughs> so I, I actually ended up hearing later, a couple months later that apparently there's a little bit of a uh, debate within the company because some everybody wanted the referral bonus and there was like a debate oh. as to like oh who had actually referred this person <laughs> because people hadn't realized that like you got them all you know, yeah yeah, yeah. Well, I, like, I think i think that's a a really great lesson amelia in one plan and two is you made your own luck yeah I think I'm very, I, I, I think, you know, persistence is maybe one of the few superpowers I have. <laughs> well, persistence is what it takes. So, so how long did you wind up going to Udacity and staying so I, there? Yeah. yeah. So I was at Udacity for two and a half years. So I eventually was, became a senior product manager there. Um, and uh, it was fantastic. You know, it was, it, was, it was really everything that I hoped. I really felt like as a product manager, I got to spend my, my days thinking about all the things that I, I really liked thinking about. And I felt like everything that I was learning, everything that I was doing was something that was going to be applicable to, um, you know, if I ever wanted to go and do a startup in the future, it was never like, I never thought that was like, an, it wasn't like an explicit part of my plan. I, I know that some people feel really strongly, like I want, I'm going to go start a company someday. And that was actually never really the case for me. I always just cared more about working on something I, I care about and with people who I like, and it didn't matter so much to me whether it was my idea or whether I started or someone else started it, but I thought it was a handy toolbox to have. I thought, well, if I ever do go and work at a super tiny startup, I do feel like these skills I'm picking as a product manager would be very applicable. So I worked there for two and a half years and I left my job at the end of 2018, um, which was quite the, you know, it was, really felt like kind of a scary decision at the time. Um, but yeah, I basically kind of stepped off the deep end and said, I think, you know, I gave my, I kind of decided one day that I was going to do it. And then I just sort of thought, well, why wait? And so I just like gave my two weeks notice, like pretty, you know, kind of, kind of like not that soon after I thought, well, I think, uh, I think I'm going to go like do this crazy thing. Well, wait, so, so, <laughs> so well, did did you have an idea? Did you sort have a of, sort of? I had a few ideas, but I don't really know if any of them were gonna work. Um, I really didn't. I really, really didn't. But now wait though, before yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt you because this this is a, a very important thing for everyone to understand. Now, were you socking away money and saving money because you thought you might do a jump? Like, you know, I mean, no. Oh, I did have money. I did have money saved up. Okay. But so I, you, it, you, you were saving money for a rainy day. Yes. I like a rainy day fund. You, yeah. you didn't, you, I, I mean, that came into play in your yes. process. Like I got, if I quit, I'm yes. going to quit, but I know I've got 18 months of runway yes. to, to live. Is that fair? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think that's an important part because sometimes I meet people who come to me for help and they say, I quit my job. And, you know, my first question, which no one ever really wants to talk about, but I always ask is, and you heard me when we first met, right. I was like, how much runway we got? And, and, and what's your burn rate? And then they tell me what they think is the answer, which is the burn rate to their company. 
And I'm not asking that question. I'm asking what's your personal burn rate right. so that we know how long you have to go. So, so you, so you did take that into a I little did. bit of account. Yeah, I definitely did. I definitely did. And you know, I, I think it's actually part of what helped me feel comfortable making what felt like kind of a crazy leap because originally when I thought about it, I was like, no, I can't do this. I was like, I don't know what I, I don't, I don't know. I've, I've never started a company before. How, how would I know how to do this? And, um, and then I kind of really went down the checklist. I was like, what are all the things that I'm scared of? I do think this would be really cool, but what are all the things that I'm scared of? And I think that like really going down that checklist actually helped me realize that a lot of them weren't as scary as I thought. So one of them was, okay, my financially secure. And I was like, well, yeah, I, I do have this rainy day fund, you know, that I've like never touched and I, I've saved it up and yeah, I, 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 I have enough. And I was like, okay, what am I scared of? I'm scared that if it doesn't, if it, if it blows up, I'll, I'll like be unhirable. Uh, you know, I, I won't be able to get a job again. And I was like, well, arguably, arguably, I think the things that I would learn trying to do this will only make me a better product manager. And it'll be up to me to sell that and kind of convince somebody that that's true and help them see that. But I think I could do that. Um, you know, I was like, well, what, you know, what else am I, what else am I scared of that my family and friends will think I'm an idiot, you know, but, um, my significant other, uh, you know, my partner here, he was totally supportive. He was actually the one trying to convince me that, you know, he thought I could do this. My family was actually hundred percent on board. They were like, you know, we're behind you all the way. If you want to do this, like you go do this, we believe in you. And so it's just like all these things that I was really scared of, honestly, we're pretty risked And I thought, well, gosh, you know, <laughs> maybe this isn't really so bad. Maybe I can do this. So I have a, you know, one of the themes listening to you, Amelia, is, is that you have this ability to basically inventory things, right? And, and, and a lot of people, and I'm curious where you got this, right? Because what you're telling me, I mean, and I, I think, you know, I have a psychology background, like you're, 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 you're going through these very, uh, you know, people pay a lot of money to do what you're self-diagnosing here. <laughs> so, so where, where did that come from? You know, where did that, is that just, is that innate in you? Did you learn that? Um, I definitely don't think it's innate. I think it's a learned thing. I'm actually a very disorganized person by nature which most people would not believe, you know, most people who've worked with me, if you told them that I was disorganized, they would just, they would just think you were talking about a different person. Cause I think, you know, they would say, Oh, Amelia is a person who's always got spreadsheets and checklists and you know, everything's very structured. But the truth is that um, I'm actually extremely disorganized by nature. Um, I was totally the kid who like forgot their homework 80% of the time. And I, I mean, I remember my teachers actually were like at some point wanted to hold me back a grade because it was just like, I was such a, I was such a mess. <laughs> They're like, Amelia's not mature enough to go on to fifth grade or whatever. Um, I had to learn to make checklists and inventory and, and do these things really almost to, to, to cope with life because I think otherwise I'd be such a mess otherwise. Um, like in college, I don't know. I was like kind of famous in college where, I mean, I literally had a printout of my daily schedule that I carried around with me 24 seven, because even after a whole semester of taking the same freaking classes on the same freaking schedule, if I lost that piece of paper, I actually couldn't remember like which class I was supposed to go to next and where it was. Um, I was like also famous for like, in my cell phone, you know, back when we like clamshells, right? Like I had to have a, a, like my phone number written out in a piece of paper taped inside my phone because I couldn't remember my own phone number. And so I would like leave voicemail messages for people where I was like, this is Amelia, call me back at, I like pull the phone away, look at it, four, six, nine, and like pull away like two, 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 as I literally couldn't remember my own phone number. Um, so this was a coping <laughs> mechanism that you learned. Yes. That, and, and it was like Amelia system. Yeah, exactly. Because I, my life would be like a shambles if I, if, I, if I didn't do this, basically. Well, it clearly worked. Um, so you do this checklist. You, you did. Now, I always ask, like, did, can you remember the, the, the morning you woke up and you were like, hey, this is, yeah, I got to make a change. Like, was it, 
uh, I call them pivotal moments, Amelia. Like I can remember these very pivotal moments in my life when I just decided, like I can remember one time I was like, I don't really like where I'm going to high school. I'm going to stay back a year and I'm going to switch high schools and do my junior year over again because I'm just not happy. And, and I can tell you that I was on a lacrosse field playing summer lacrosse, taking a ball out of bounds when I made that decision. Like that, that's literally where I made that decision. The next morning I got in my Jeep, I drove down to this high school and I was like, Hey, I, I want to join your high school. And they're like, wow. So, so, you know, I call them these and it, and it literally changed the course of my life. And I can remember these very uh, explicit times. So was this, do you have that type of memory or, or is it more of a morphine of two weeks that you're just sort of. No, it was definitely, there was a moment. It was, it was actually pretty fast. Um, I think I spent a lot of time thinking about the checklist and what was on my list of fears that took some time. Then I took some more time. So that's probably, actually it's probably a couple months. I would say the, there were a couple months where I was like, what am I scared of? Um, and then it actually didn't take that long to really go through the checklist and realize that they weren't that scary. That probably only took like a week. Um, and it was really like a week in the beginning of October. And I actually gave myself a deadline because I was sort of annoyed with myself for being very wishy-washy about this decision. I thought, I'm going to give myself a deadline. I actually emailed a bunch of friends and I said, I'm going to make this decision within 30 days. I'm going to tell you whether I'm leaving or staying. I have some accountability, huh? <laughs> I was like, check back with me in 30 days. I'll have decided what I'm doing. Um, cause I, I did want to give myself some sort of time box to make the decision. In. Um, and once I went through that checklist and really convinced myself, I was like, yeah, I'm, I am really convinced that this is like something I could do. I mean, Kier will tell you, um, Kier will tell you that I, I he, he thought it was ridiculous. Um, I basically looked at him and I said, oh, maybe I should give my notice on Thursday. And he, <laughs> and he was like, you're, you're just gonna, he's like, I'm, he's like, yeah, cool. I, I mean, I, he, you know, he's listening to me like talk through this and he's like, yes, I agree. Okay, cool. Seems like you're convinced. Uh, but he was just like, so shocked. You know, he was so shocked. And I was like, well, why wait? Like life isn't getting any shorter. I'm not going to change my mind on this decision. I'm convinced. Um, I think it's a good time. Uh, <laughs> so you give your notice and you have some ideas, but not the idea. I wasn't sure. Yeah, I had, a, I had some ideas, but I didn't know. I honestly didn't know if anything were going to work out. I didn't know if um, I would end up going with any of them. How long did you have? Money-wise. Um, well... Money-wise, I knew I could make it at least for a year if I, was, if I was prudent, but I actually wanted to peg myself at a year anyway, not for the runway, but because I was pretty sure I was going to want to give up before then. So Kira will tell you, yeah, so I gave myself this, I was like, I had worked in enough startups that I, I mean, I, I wasn't going in completely blind. I knew, I knew that it was going to be hard and I knew that probably parts of it were going to suck and that I was probably going to be extremely demoralized for at least part of it. And that there would be times when I would be very, very tempted to give up. But I also really wanted to give it a, a real go. And I didn't want to kind of like let myself kind of give up too easily. So I told myself, I'm going to try for at least a year because that way, even if I go through these parts where I feel super sucky and demoralized, which I'm sure are coming, I will stick with it for, until a year. Because and then you it, have the because you have the deadline. You're just that, or because you set that stake thing. in the sand. Yes. You're like, hey, I'm just gonna I'm going to this. wake up tomorrow and see what happens. I yeah, I was like, I'm just going to commit to this. I'm going to stick it out for a year because I think that a year feels like a reasonable amount of time. Where if I want to. If I want to throw in the towel then, I will at least feel like I really gave this a good shot. I really gave it my best and I wasn't just kind of giving up because it was, felt easy at the time, you know? So anyway, so that's, that's how that went. So that's cool. And now how do you get 
to the idea and what month is that? Oh, that was actually very fast. So I left Udacity and I spent about two weeks. Well, I immediately started kind of just like, I, I immediately started working on the ideas that I had. Um, and I would say within two weeks, it was very clear to me which one I was going to work on. What, what does it mean work on these ideas? Yeah, sorry. So I was doing a lot of like, okay, these are things that I want. How do I figure out if they're things that other people want? So I would be like doing things like going and looking on Google Trends for like searches of keywords. I was putting up dummy websites. I was like trying to look around and see like what else is in the, are in these spaces. I was literally just like telling random idea, these random ideas to like my coworkers, like at, at my, at my going away party. Right. I was like, these are the things I'm working on. And I was just like paying attention to what people were reacting to and what they weren't reacting to and who wanted what. Um, and I was like starting to, I started to run uh, small scale ad campaigns on like a uh, Facebook or something where I would just kind of like hypothetically describe these products and kind of be looking for like click through rates. Right. I was, I was just trying to try to make guesses. Um, and I would say that within about two weeks, I knew that saga was the thing I was going to work on that I was really going to, I was going to drop everything else. And I was going to just focus on this. I don't think I knew I was going to arrive at that quite so fast, but it did happen that way. It was something that, um, so all of the ideas were things that I personally related to. Saga was a very personal one, which was that I had literally been begging my parents for probably about 10 years to save these stories that used to tell me and my sister when we were kids growing up. Um, and I always wanted to have these like saved somehow. I would always tell them, you got to have a book written about you or like a documentary or something. Um, you know, and they'd always say, well, that sounds great, Amelia. We're so flattered, but what a huge chore. We're not going to write a book. Okay, maybe when we retire. Maybe when we retire. That sounds like a really big project. Um, but every time I described to other people this idea, there was this depth of Im immediate emotional connection that far outweighed any of the other ideas I was throwing around. The other stuff I would throw around, people like, that's cool. I want that. But when I talked about Saga and the concept of it, I would just get strangers at parties just going on and on with me about how, oh my gosh, we tried to do this with my grandma last year. You know, we like sat her on, on, a, on a stool in the kitchen. And I, I remember I got, I got the video camera out and, and we tried to film it, you know, or I, I, my uncle Joe, my uncle Joe tried to do this with my grandpa. And he's got voice memos like saved on his phone somewhere. And we don't even know where they are. Like, I, I don't even know where he's kept them. Um, and just like, I would just bring the idea up at random parties and it would start this huge conversation. And like the entire group would just be like talking about this idea. Like P I wouldn't even have to like insert myself in the conversation. People would just, people would just start talking about it. And um, the idea is that you record family stories. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Is sorry. I should put that at the beginning, but how you save life stories of people you love, your family, loved ones. Um, and in particular, you know, and not just like, Hey, here's some photos. Right. Um, but really capturing like stories and memories from their perspective like in their voice. Um, so that, that was kind of the seed of it really. Um, and it was perfect because, I mean, I had wanted to do this with my parents for like the longest time. So I basically figured I was going to start experimenting with them. And I would say, I basically told my mom and dad, I said, look, you know, I've been wanting to do this forever. I'm going to experiment on you. And so just let me try like 10 bazillion different things on you. And uh, you know, what's the worst that comes out of it? the worst that could come out of it is I finally end up with these stories captured that I've wanted saved for so many years anyway. Right. So like, I'm going to like try a bunch of things on you, but I'm also going to finally get the thing that I've wanted. Um, so that's how it started, you know? And, and, and of course what ended up coming out of this too was a couple of my coworkers said, I actually, I really want this for my family. Like, would, would you do this for my family? So I said, yeah, great. Uh, so yeah, within about two weeks, I was booking times with, family and, and family of friends where I was like, you know, calling them up on hangouts or the phone or whatever, like however I could get a, a hold of them and, and essentially trying to interview them. Um, 
So the, the, the concept is you record the life stories for people that gets maintained in a central repository so that everyone can find them and they're easily cataloged for the life of the family. Yes. Although I don't think I knew that so clearly. I, I certainly wouldn't have been phrased it that way at the beginning. At the beginning, it was just like, I just want these stories saved. Um, but, but yes, I would say that within about three months, I knew that I was going to do this using voice um, and that, uh, and that was going to be the format I was going to use. So, um, so yeah, so the core of the product actually really hasn't changed too much in that perspective. What we do today is we're, yeah, we're, we're an app and we help, we help families save the life stories of loved ones. We make it really easy using voice. Uh, we basically take your grandma's memories and turn it into a podcast for your family. It's, it's really kind of what it is. Um, so how does that, how, how does it, uh, explain how it works? They down, someone downloads the app. Yes. They yeah. create an account very quickly. Yes. And, um, we send weekly questions, uh, to you and your family. So you, you invite who you want. The question prompts are things like, what's the biggest trouble you ever got into when you were a kid? There are these things that are meant to prompt memories. And then we make it really easy for anybody to record. So you can even record without the app by calling a special phone number. You just dial a special phone number. And so you don't even need a smartphone. There's no typing. You can even do it from a landline. So anybody can really use it. And then the audio gets captured and saved and shared with your family. A lot like getting a podcast episode, actually. Um, so that's, that's often how I describe it to people. I said, it's kind of like if you were getting a private podcast for your family of your grandma's childhood stories. Um, that's what it's like. That's cool. Thank you. It's funny though, because I mean, that really isn't how it started, right? I mean, it, it actually took a lot, a lot of variations and learning, uh, one, to get, to get even to that basic concept, and two, to learn how to describe it to other people. Um, yeah. <laughs> Your elevator pitch. Exactly. What's the one sentence description? That was very hard. <laughs> it, yeah, it's hard. It is hard. People think that that's the easy part. That's one of the hardest no. parts. You, you really iterate hard. that a lot. Um, and, I, and, I, and, and I do want to mention that you didn't start off with the name Saga. You, 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 kept, uh, you had another name. What is it? Keep Life Stories. And Keep Life Stories. So what made you change it, the name just because it was long? Um, yeah, two things. So I was never particularly wedded to the name to begin with. In fact, I was all about speed. You know, at the beginning, it was really about validation of the idea. And so literally, I, I just went and tried to find a domain name that was cheap. Um, and I found Keep Life Stories. And it, it was cheap, so I, I, just, I just took it. But um, I also, at the time, thought that maybe SEO was going to be a good acquisition channel. And so I thought it might be prudent to pick a domain name that would help for SEO. Um, and I did look, kind of look around in the space and I saw other businesses had done, had done that. Um, and so it was very much a, it was a choice of kind of a little bit of, a little bit of, you know, strategy, but, but mostly expediency. Um, and I always thought, and, and so what, had, what ended up happening was pretty quickly, I figured out that SEO, while it did drive some traffic, was not going to be the main channel. Um, this wasn't something where people would actively go search for it, but I did know that if I told people about the idea and put it in front of them, I could get really strong reactions. Um, I, I definitely saw that, uh, not just from bringing it up with people, but even from these little Facebook ad campaigns that I was running. I was able to get like really good click-through rates, you know, on, 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 on this description of this hypothetical product. Um, and so I knew that, you know, well, okay, SEO is not important. Um, and so, yeah, I, maybe I should change the, you know, maybe I should change the name to something that's like easier, but I basically figured it wasn't important to worry about until later. I really did feel like let's worry more about proving that this is something people are going to want, that they're going to pay for. Um, you can do all that with pretty much any name. So that's not, you know, the name isn't going to be what makes or breaks that. Let's just focus on that. So we only changed the name after we closed our fundraise, actually. I think at that point, we're like, okay, 
all right, let's change the name now. <laughs> so, so what made you, uh, uh, there's a few things I want to talk about. One is, uh, first thing is, I don't think you have, and you're really, I mean, in your journey, you're, what, what are we, two years in, two and a half years yeah, in? Yeah, no, it's, yeah, maybe a year, year and a half, year and a half. Or a year and a half in, um, but you, you don't have your original co-founder, right? That's right, that's right. So, so, so that changed out already and that's not uncommon, but I'm only mentioning it because listeners sometimes feel like, you know, it's all going to be rosy and everybody's going to, it's all going to work out and doesn't always work out for you. Um, I think it worked out pretty well that you guys had a good friendship and, and. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, he's, he's awesome. Yeah. So it didn't turn out into ugly thing. Um, no, not at all. What, what made you decide Amelia? Because you and I have talked about this before, and, and and you know where I, where I sometimes tr- tend to go is why did you decide to raise money? Yeah, I remember. I mean, I remember that even being. I'm pretty sure that came up in probably one of the, you know, probably the first conversation we ever we ever had. Um. So yeah. So my original co-founders were really well. Actually, I started out with no co-founders. So I started out by myself. Um. But then. Uh, so, so yeah, my original co-founder who ended up joining, he's really a great friend of mine. And it was actually something that we, we talked about a lot it's because, because, you know, Saga was something we felt very passionately about. It was certainly something that could have remained a passion project for us. You know, and we basically talked about, do we keep this running kind of on the side? And, you know, we can make some families very happy. And that's certainly very fulfilling for us. We can, we can, keep, we can keep this running. Or do we want to go all in on it and try to make it something huge? Um, and kind of what are the trade-offs of that? And, you know, certainly if you want to go make it something huge, uh, going and getting funding can be a way uh, to, to accelerate that, right? Um, and in the end, I mean, we, we actually really talked about it for a very long time, but um, in the end, I really, I really said, you know, I think we, sh- I think we should swing for it. I think we should swing for it. I, I think, I think, I think we should try. And, um, the reason for me at least why was because by that point, I can't tell you how many families I had talked to literally, I cannot tell you how many families I talked to who said to me, I wish that this had existed three years ago. I wish that I knew this existed. I wish I had this for my grandpa. And I really felt like, you know, I know people aren't searching for this, but if they just knew that it existed, like how amazing would that be if we could really change someone's, someone's life or their family's life? And so I really thought we kind of owe it to, to ourselves and to them. Let's try. Let's try to get this out into the world. And, you know, I, I worked in startups. I, I know what the odds are like. I get it. I get it that this is a risk that we're taking, but like, let's go try. So that, that was how we decided to do it. And um, what, what's your takeaway from that experience? Because uh, I think we've had a bunch of conversations through that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. What a, that was like one of the craziest things I've ever lived through, Randon. Right. So, I mean, just, just, to give some color to people that you, you, you sort of need to be ready for, um, you got to be strapped in, right? I mean, it is a roller coaster. I mean, it is going from one day you might have the money in the bank and the next day you might not, right? So, you know, I think the funny thing is I was really, ex- I was really prepared for it to be the opposite. We were all prepared for it to be opposite. So by that time we'd actually brought on another. What do you another, mean by opposite? Another, you were prepared for it to be. Oh, I was prepared for it to, there to be no interest and for it to be an endless slog. That's oh. what I thought fundraising was going to be like. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> turned out a little better for you, but yeah. I know I know it was great. It was great for on the half, but you know, I, I, we had no idea, you know, we'd never fundraised before. We were first time founders. I'd certainly never gone pitching. Um, I didn't even have, I didn't even have a pitch deck. You know that, like, I mean, we were, we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, and so well, but we did whip that up in 72 hours. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Yo, you were, yeah. So for everybody listening, 
uh, Brendan was amazing. <laughs> was practically my advisor on call during that time. There were a lot of last minute, late night texts. Like, I'm getting asked this, and I have no idea what what this means. Like, but like, you, but you got it, and we tried. What yeah. what what do you think was the key? Um. Yeah. To to that, I, I mean, you did have interest. I mean, it was a, a it was a roller coaster. I think for you, the expectation was was. Uh, probably nobody's going to be interested. So yeah. I'm just going to prepare like I did for that year. I'm going to set a timeline. And if it works, because I remember you saying, if it works, it does. It does. If it doesn't, I'm good with it. I tried. Um, but what do you think was it about your, was it, was it the, the, the market opportunity? Was it your passion? I mean, what, what is it that you think really changed that that people became interested. I mean, you're yeah. clearly very convincing lady. <laughs> <laughs> you're very convincing. Yeah. So, you know, but but for the for the mere mortals out there like us, what is that that, you know, if there's a technique or or what was it? If you if Yeah. You know that. You know, that's a great question. And, you know, I actually ended up asking some of our eventual investors that question after the money had arrived in our bank account, because I was, I thought it'd be a great learning opportunity. You know, I was genuinely curious. I thought, well, so why did you mess? <laughs> what convinced you? I loved, I'd love to know. Um, but so I think there are two things that kind of come to mind immediately for me. Um, one, on a very tactical side, and I don't think this has anything to do with whether, I don't think this has anything to do with your business idea or the market opportunity or whether you think you're a great founder or not, is literally just revising and revising and revising and just putting your pitch deck in front of as many people who would possibly look at it as possible. Um, I remember going in, I, I, we, I, we did a few pitches and uh, they did not go well. You know, and it was a very, it was a very fast no. And I remember thinking like, well, maybe, maybe this is just a crappy idea. And it wasn't until uh, one of my friends told me, he said, do you know, it took us like 12 revisions of our pitch deck before it became anywhere near reasonable. And I thought, oh, oh, okay. So that's actually normal. That's fine. Okay. Well, if that's what it is, okay, I can get on that train. Um, and I found every friend I had, you know, this is where I think the benefit came in of just having worked in startups for so long, but I really rounded up, you know, just every friend I had who'd ever fundraised successfully and said, look at my pitch deck and tear it apart and tell me all the things that are wrong with it. Okay, great. I'm going to have my homework. I'm going to go, I'm going to fix it. Okay. What about now? And just rinse and repeat over and over and over again. You know, um, here's, I mean, I literally, that meetup, that meetup where we met the, um, uh, I'm pre I, there were previous sessions where I would come and I'd say, Hey, Hey guys, here's my pitch. You know, and I was like practicing my pitch and I like do my pitch. I'm like, okay. Like, give me feedback. Right. <laughs> um, and, uh, so, so I, I think that realizing that, and I wish I had understood that earlier. I wish I had understood that that was actually very, very normal. And that I don't think anybody starts out honestly with an amazing polished pitch. I think everybody starts out with it being clunky and rocky and it's just not great. And it is just going to take time and, yeah, and repetition. Well, it, it, the, the, uh, I don't know, Mark Twain or whoever, the first draft is always shit. Like it's, it's just the way yeah. it is, but, it's but just it is. You, yeah, I mean, we talked to you and I talked about it. I was like, you got it. I mean, we needed to get you to a decent place, right? <laughs> yeah. So that you had some fundamentals that might've been missing there, but we got you there. And then it's being able to iterate. And I think where people make the mistake is, is what you've just said, is they're so stuck on their idea that they believe this is how it should be and they won't change. And if you will not revise and not be open to these ideas, then you, you won't be successful in that because you, you will, unless you get like absolutely lucky. Would you agree? No, maybe. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, well, I, mean, I, mean, I just, I mean, I had certainly no illusions, you know, I felt like I don't know anything about this stuff. And so, I, I mean, I, I was desperate for any feedback I could get. I was like, great. I, I'm going to work on all of that. You know, that was, that was kind of how I felt about it. But um, so I think that's one big, one big thing is revision. The second big thing that I think, you know, if I could do it all again, I wish I had just, it, it, we figured it out, but I wish we'd figured it out sooner 
was um, I really should have been more open-minded about where we were going to find our first supporters and not just like supporters, like cheerleaders, but really investors. So I had thought, okay, the way I'm going to go about this is I'm going to go make a big spreadsheet of all these. I'm going to go online. I'm going to research investors. I'm going to make a big target spreadsheet, which is, you know, it's kind of how I did my job search, right? I'm going I'm to go pitch these people because these are investors. These are professional investors. This is how this works. And you know, the person who actually ends up becoming our first angel investor was an old coworker of mine who reached out to me, cold reached out to me on LinkedIn and was like, hey, I heard you're working on this thing. You know, I think it sounds really cool. I would love to angel invest. Well, I had no idea, you know, <laughs> I had no idea that he angel invested. And thank goodness that he reached out because I'm, I'm, I, I'm a thousand percent sure I never, it never would have occurred to me in a million years to reach out to him to even ask. And that's I, all our very first supporters, all the people who became our first angel investors, those very, those very first checks, they were people who knew us and were betting on us because they believed in us. You know, it's like, I don't even, I don't even think I had to show them a pitch deck. You know, they really were just betting on us. And if I had understood that sooner, I would have been a lot more open-minded about where I went for that first bit of support. I, I would have gone to my personal network and I would have said, hey, everybody, do you know anybody who's an angel investor? Or, you, you know, like I, I, instead of me thinking I had to go online and like research who are professional investors and, you know, that had to be my, my target list. Because what ended up happening was that started the whole train. We had our first few supporters, just the first few. And those people ended up telling other people who then told other people who then told other people. And that's how we really ended up getting to, you know, it was probably a second or third degree connect connection through these first few checks that we got our first um, term sheet. You know, that's, that's really how it happened. So yeah, I would, uh, that's, the, that's the second big thing. I would say, you know, that, that worked for us. And if I were going to do it all again, and, and also what I've told other people when they, they fundraise, when they're first time fundraisers is to be more open-minded about, you know, where are you going to find those first checks? You, you honestly, you, you just, you never really know. You could be pleasantly surprised. So what did, what did, yeah, I'm curious, what, what did some of your investors say at the end why they did, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> not the friends and family. Right. right I think right. that's a, I think that, I think that's a great takeaway, which is, and I, you, you never know who's, everybody's an investor. Like you, you, you don't know. I've met investors. I just had no idea. Yeah. Right. So, so I think that's a great takeaway for people to, to know that sometimes your investors right in front of you. <laughs> you, you, you know what I mean? It's not the brand on Sand Hill Road that you necessarily need um, out of the yeah. gate or anything like that. So what, what, but, but I'm curious about, you know, cause I think that's, I love hearing the type of feedback, like, hey, what got you over the hump, right? Like, yeah, what totally. actually made oh, you press so enter in, in, on that water? Yeah. And I'm, I mean, I'm somebody who I thrive on feedback and I love, I love that stuff. I mean, if, even if it's, even if it's negative, I still love knowing it. Um, and uh, yeah, it was actually remarkably consistent, you know, and I, across, across the board, it was really, uh, yes, there were people who were like, you know, I think this is an interesting business and you know, I see the market opportunity and, you know, I think audio is blowing up. Um, baby boomer, boomers are aging. I, I see there being a market, you know, among seniors and their families, but, but, but by far in a way it was, but I'm betting on you. I'm betting on you. I'm betting on you as a person. Um, either because they had, you know, we had been referred to them through somebody who they trusted and they thought, you know, you so-and-so really like really really has conviction in you and is kind of betting on you as a person i trust them and so i think i think i i believe it um or possibly you know i i i think i am probably somebody who lives life with with a lot of conviction about choices that i make whether they're good or bad frankly you know kira always jokes with me um you know my, my partner he always said, you know, if you're running in the wrong direction, you're like really sure though. You're like really sure that you're like, that's the direction. And you, you know, you'll change your mind at some point and then you'll go some other, you're like, okay, now this is the new direction. But I, he said, 
But if you're going to make a wrong decision, you do a lot of conviction. Uh, <laughs> well, you, you I, I think you, when you make those decisions, you have to really believe them because yeah. you've got to go all in or you yes. will never know that it was wrong. Yes. Yeah. And I, I do think that's true. You know, I think that, you know, partly, you know, you know, people, sometimes that people say, you know, you're very convincing. Um, but I think that part of that is because I, I really do believe the things that I'm saying. I'm not trying to like sell you some kind of snake oil where, you know, I don't believe it. Like, you know, like I've convinced myself, I've convinced myself and I, I think it's true. So, so then it becomes very easy, you know, to tell you why, why, you know, this is, this is something that I think, I think is, is a good idea. So you've raised a bunch of money. Um, you just released your, your, your newest app version. Yes. Yeah. What are you, what are you most scared of now? Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. So, so I guess going from there to here, maybe just to fill in the color of the journey a bit. Um, yeah, we, we rate, we raise money. It honestly, it went, it went extremely fast. Um, we were not expecting it. We had to learn very, very quickly on a compressed timeline, as I'm sure you remember from a lot of, uh, late night calls and, and texts. Um, we closed over, over three times, you know, the original amount that we sort of dreamed of, of being able to raise, frankly, we just didn't know like what was possible. Um, Andrew, my co-founder and I, uh, went all in, you know, um, and we started out as a team of two and now we're a team of four and we're hiring for employee number five. And, uh, as you mentioned, we just released our, our app. Um, so you can go search for it, Saga in the iOS app store. Um, and, and leave uh, a review once you like please it. Do. <laughs> if you're so inclined, leave us a review. We'd love that. But, um, we were just, we were, so we ran flat out. We ran flat out for about eight weeks to get that app out at the beginning of the year. Um, we knew that we wanted to build an app at some point, but we decided early this year, we're going to pull the trigger and do it. And that became even more true, honestly, when, when the quarantine hit and when coronavirus hit, because we were really starting to see how, if this tool existed, how it could provide immediate value um, for families who were trying to stay in touch with loved ones near and far um, and people who were thinking about older loved ones. Um, so we, uh, we launched a week ago and we were very prepared for it to just be crickets, you know, cause you know, you climb one mountain and now, now it's the next one. We were very prepared to be like, all right, next mountain to climb is we got to make sure the world knows about us. We were very, very fortunate. We actually got picked up in an article by CNET. So CNET wrote yeah, about Yeah, but, but when you, when you, when you say that, I, I just have this inclination that it just, didn't happen. Did it really happen? Or was it an Amelia happen that eight people recommended that CNET write an article about? <laughs> we tried. I pitched. Yeah, no, we pitched a lot of people. We pitched a lot of people and some of it worked out and some of it didn't. And I, I have to be honest, I actually didn't know if, if CNET was really going to write about us. So I knew they might write about us, but I wasn't pinning my hopes on it. And they really did, which was great. Is, um, it, but, is this a, uh, you dig in and finding the writers and pitching them? Is no, this one, this one, this one, I can't claim credit. I can't claim all, I can't claim credit for. We got, um, so at this point we had investors. And so I don't know anything about pitching press. And so I, I went to our advisors, I went to our investors and said, help me with this. Um, and they actually helped me a ton with figuring out how to connect uh, with people and uh, we're just really awesome coaches. So that's not something where I felt like I had a lot of expertise, um, cre credit to them really, you know, for, for helping us with that. Um, and, uh, so we got the article written about us and we shot up that day, like just last Tuesday, we shot up from number 94 in the app store when you search for saga to number three overnight. Um, it's awesome. and we were, we were just below Candy Crush Saga, which is so crazy. I mean, that like Candy Crush Saga has like a million and a half reviews. And then there's our little tiny app, like sitting right underneath it. But then get this, the next day we were number two. And the next day we were number one. Wow. And it was driven, it was absolutely driven by people checking out the app, people going and being interested enough that they were actually downloading it, you know, 
and uh, and 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 leaving a review. Um, and so we're now we're now ranked number one. Still, yeah, like if you go search today, we're number one um, above Candy Crush Saga, which is crazy. That's um, awesome. It was wonderful though. It was wonderful, and we started getting signups, and we started getting support tickets and bug tickets, and you know, I'm even happy about the bug tickets because it's just like people are really using it and they care enough about it that when something's broken, they're telling you, you know, um, cause they want to People fixed. can, people can try it for free now, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Try You can try it for free. Um, so please go, please go check it out. I, I would, I would absolutely love to hear by the way, you know, like what, what you think I'm, I, um, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if we can like, you know, figure out a way to, to, to let people contact, contact me, but I would really love to hear what people think. Um, we have so much planned in the works, so many things that we want to improve and add. And I would just love to hear, you know, what, what people Well, like. you have a way that people can reach you on your website? Yes. Yeah. I think our emails, our emails at the bottom is just like, it's just like team, you know, team at trisaw.com. Like we read every, I, I mean, literally every, every single email that comes in and is so valuable to us. Um, and so, again, that, that, that URL is try T R Y S A G A dot com. Com. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for and reiterating t- And the email, if you want to write is team at try saga.com and Amelia or her co-founder will get back to you. Yes. Yes, we absolutely will. Um, so, so, so I want, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let you off the hook on this Yeah, one. sorry. I still haven't answered the question. <laughs> uh, which is what, like, what are you worried what about, worried about? When, when you put your head on the pillow now at night? Yeah. So, you know, for me, it's about not losing this momentum. This so, this so hard won momentum, you know, that we have. Um, I don't want us to get complacent. You know, I don't want us to feel like, okay, great. We climbed this mountain and we built this thing. We got onto the world and we got some users. Good job us. I mean, I do want us to celebrate that and we should celebrate that, but, but then, you know, there's a next mountain to climb. And I think for us, it's about making, making an absolutely wonderful product, right? For every single person who has, who has tried this so far, these are our, our, these are our earliest supporters. Um, and, uh, I just, we just want to make it, we just want to make it wonderful for them. So, so yeah, it's, it's about not, not losing momentum, um, not getting complacent, not getting lazy, not that we have so far, but I just, I don't, I don't want us to start now. Um, and, and kind of, and kind of climbing that next mountain. Yeah. Cool. Congratulations. It's Thank you been so much. really fun watching you go through this and, and making it, making it happen. I'm really grateful for you sharing the, the good, bad, and the ugly. Because uh, yeah. not 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 every everyone will will do that, but you know these are the types of stories and I, revelations or just revealing the truth, other than the you know CNET story or the TechCrunch story or the absolutely you know that makes it look like it all happened overnight, because um, it it doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> <laughs> success can once you get the once you get the flywheel going you get momentum but to get that is is really hard um so congratulations to you and your team and i'm looking forward to watching your journey i'd love to have you back here in a few months and and hear hear how it all is happening and um i don't want to leave without three HPTs from you on your experience for fellow entrepreneurs who are either, you know, trying to take the leap or raise them, whatever you think from this whole journey that yeah. you've had here, what, what would be your, your three HPTs? Right. So it's funny cause I feel like they've already been alluded to. Um, well, you, so hopefully uh, well, those you, familiar. You, can, you can just summarize. Oh yeah. Them. No, I will. Yeah, I will. I, <laughs> Yeah, I'll just, I'll summarize them. So one is, I really think that, um, that just putting yourself out there for feedback and revision over and over and over and over again is so important. And I think that's really, really hard for founders. You, your identity and your, your sense of self-worth is so tied to this thing, this baby that you've created. And you're almost like embarrassed to put it out there. I mean, not even almost, you are embarrassed, right? To put out there into the world, this thing that's like, 
I mean, I can't even tell you what the first version of Saga was. The first version of Saga was me literally calling people on the phone, you know, and then like downing the file and emailing it to them. It's like, is that the product that I envisioned? No, you know, um, but that's what I have. And so, you know, I think just like, as hard as it is, just, just keep putting yourself out there. Just keep putting yourself out there and just know it's going to take 200, 2000, you know, revisions and iterations, right? But you'll get there, you'll get better. So that's one. Um, two is, I think, I wish I could have told my past self to be more open-minded about where support was going to come from. And I know I kind of alluded to that for the fundraising, but I would actually say that in general. Um, I did this thing, and I guess I'll share this as maybe a specific tactic that I, I, I maybe that, that I would recommend very early on, like literally after like the two weeks after I left my job, I actually started a uh, mailing list. It's almost like an online, it's almost like a little diary. And I had basically uh, offered to friends and uh, coworkers and family. I said, Hey, if you're a lot of people said they were very curious about what was going to happen. And so I said, well, I could have like a million coffees each week, or maybe I'll just, I'll just send a little email update about my life. So I started building this like subscriber list of people, um, you know, <laughs> I think we're just curious and I would just use it as like a confessional. I would just be like, all right, well, here's my life and here's what's great about it. And here's what's sucky. And here's what I'm working on that email list turned into this incredible resource for me where six months later, I would actually have this section in the email that would say, Hey, I, here's my asks. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how you, um, pitch businesses for partnerships. I don't know the first thing about this. I'm like going to this conference and I'm trying. So, um, anybody here know about this, you know, and at this point they're probably like 70, 80 people on this list. And so someone would respond and say, yeah, I, I know something about this. You know, it was great. I had built up this list of just like people who cared about me and I didn't even know all the ways they could help me, but I was just like, Hey, here's what I need help with. That's a great and, tip. Oh my gosh. It was amazing. I mean, I really just stumbled into it, honestly. Right. Cause that's not how I intended to use the email list, but, um, yeah, it was great. And so I just have these asks every time and, and people would reach out. Um, so yeah, th so I guess I'll say that about kind of the, like, um, you know, be, be open-minded about you know, where that support is gonna go for, put yourself out there, you never know, you never know, you really don't. Um, yeah, and the third one is to, I think, uh, you know, yes, put yourself out there, but I think also be, no, I think, I think also be really tactical too about who you're going to, who um, is really gonna help you take your pitch from, you know, V, V V two or V three to you know V six. There were there's a there was a short list. I mean, yes, I, I would pay. I, I was definitely paying attention the entire time. Um, to there were always a couple people who really stepped out, really stepped up, and went above and beyond to help to help. And you were one of them. You know, you were definitely one of them. And um, don't 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 waste that. You know, like make take like take advantage of that you know you he's brandon <laughs> well, but you you helped us get really whipped into shape right and and you know me like i i came to you time and time again for advice um when you find those people who are willing to step on, on a limb and, and help you out um you know don't 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 miss the opportunity yeah i think that's a, a good good lesson and for all the listeners i did offer and amelia did run it like a show. Like, Hey, I need to meet you at three o'clock on Saturday. Can we do that? Yeah, sure. Whatever you need. We'll, we'll make that happen. And, and, and we did, but I think that's, I think those are really good tips and yeah, thank you so much for sharing this. Um, I know you're going to have success and you're going to make it happen. If there's anybody who can make it happen. It will be you. And I think you have a great product. And you know, I, when I think about it, it, it goes back to the very origins of our, of of the civilizations of the world earth yeah, it does it, it, it is you know stories are passed on by by telling them and recording them and um you know modern technology has allowed us to do that in people's own voice and i think there's um humans and stories there that's the essence of humanity it's what we're doing right now 
you right. know. But yeah, we just told your Straight story. Right now, yeah, exactly. recorded that story, um, and people will, will benefit from it from a really long for a really long time. And and for many ways, is that you know the stories reveal the things that we don't think, um, or or help the stories that we've told in our own head may or may not actually be true. Um, so that is the essence of communication of mankind. So you are right there at the least common denominator. So that's exciting. Well, well, thanks a lot, Amelia. You enjoy your weekend and we're going to have you back in a few months. Maybe, uh, maybe we'll still be at home. I don't know, but uh, I'll nail you down and we'll, we'll get a, a date on the calendar. So congratulations on your success so far. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me. Right on. Take care.